We're now going to give you an introduction to hearing. You'd say, what? Hearing. All right. Uh, uh, some ter uh, terms that you've heard before is you might have heard the term outer ear, middle ear, and inner ear. So let's just look at a picture so we understand what it is we're referring to. Let's take a look at page 81G. Uh, Actually, let's, uh, yeah, 81, uh, not 81G, that was 81G. Uh, let's look on page, uh, well, 81J. Now look at 81J. All right, you'd say, what am I looking at here? This is page 81J. And uh, this is somebody's, this is this funny thing right here. This is actually called the pin. This is the pin. It says it right there. It's right there, pin. Everything has a name. You just didn't, maybe didn't know what it was. All right, this is the pinna. Right here's the earlobe. This is the auditory canal. In anatomy, you call it the external auditory meatus, or external acoustic meatus, the auditory canal. And here's the eardrum, or tympanic membrane. This is called the outer ear. This is the outer ear. Uh, I think I've got even a better picture. Just, let me just... All right, well, we'll leave it at that. So uh, this is the outer ear. Now, this area right here, where you have three little bones, and you might have heard this in anatomy class, there are three little bones or ossicles. They are known in English as the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. Or their uh, scientific names are valleus, incus, and stapes. We'll see these written out in a moment. Anybody ever hear about those three little ear bones? Those are in the middle ear. These are the, this is the middle ear. So the middle ear is where these three little bones are and the eustachian tube. This is the eustachian tube. You may have learned about the eustachian tube or auditory tube in anatomy. That's a tube that connects up to what? Anybody know? To the throat. Connects to the throat technically what's called the nasopharynx, and it allows air to flow from your throat into the middle ear. And the reason why we want air to flow through this eustachian tube into the middle ear is so that the air pressure on this side of the eardrum, or tympanic membrane, is the same as the air pressure on the outside of your eardrum, or tympanic membrane. If the air pressure is different in the middle ear than it is in the outer ear, you're not going to hear properly. You may experience a popping sensation, or it may feel like you're listening inside of a, a, a barrel. OK, we'll see all this is written in a moment. Now, the inner ear, the so-called inner ear, is this area right here. You'd say, what's that? What's this mess? In the inner ear are two structures. We mentioned them last class meeting. The cochlea, which looks like a snail, that's the structure for hearing. And this other stuff here is the vestibular apparatus. So it says semicircular canals, but that's part of what's called the vestibular apparatus. And that's for balance and equilibrium. And what's leaving, what's coming off the cochlea and the vestibular apparatus is the vestibulocochlear nerve, cranial nerve number eight. You can see a bigger picture of this right down here. Right? Cochlea for hearing and the vestibular apparatus for balance and equilibrium. And here's the vestibulocochlear nerve, cranial nerve number eight. You'd say, wait a second, let me write all this other stuff. We'll come back to that. We're not done. Okay, always give you plenty of time to write stuff. All right, so we've talked about what is called the outer ear, right? That's the pinna, the auditory canal, the tympanic membrane or eardrum, the middle ear, which is those three ear bones, and the eustachian canal, and the inner ear, 
which is the cochlea and the vestibular apparatus. All right, so let's go back to uh, page 81G. So back on page 81G, where we're learning about hearing. So I've written all this out. What's the outer ear? The pinna, the external auditory meatus, or canal, and the tympanic membrane, or eardrum. And I wrote that what sound waves do sound is vibrating air molecules. And these uh, sound waves vibrate against our eardrum or tympanic membrane. We'll see a picture of that in just a moment. Now, the middle ear. In the middle ear are those three ear ossicles or bones. The purpose of those three bones is to amplify the sound waves. To make the sound waves, uh, to amplify them, to make them louder, vibrate more. And the, uh, there are three ear bones, the malleus or hammer, like the word mallet or hammer, the incus or anvil, and the stapes, which is Latin for stirrup, because like, it's shaped like the stirrup that you put your feet into if you're either riding a horse or you're having a gynecological exam. It's called stirrups. All right, so anyhow, uh, also part of the middle ear is the eustachian canal or auditory tube. So here I've written out what the purpose of that eustachian canal is. The eustachian canal or auditory tube allows air to flow from your nasopharynx. You'd say, what's that? The nasopharynx, and if you had me for anatomy, I certainly covered that. Pharynx means what? Throat. The throat is actually divided into an upper, middle, and lower part. The upper part of the throat is called the nasopharynx. The middle part is called the oropharynx, and the lower part is called the laryngopharynx. But anyhow, this, these tubes, and there's a pair of eustachian canals, they branch off the upper part of your throat called the nasopharynx. They allow air to flow through these eustachian canals or auditory tubes to the middle ear. The middle ear is where those little bones are. What's the purpose of that? That's to allow the air pressure in the middle ear to be equal to the air pressure on the outside of your ear. So the air pressure's got to be the same on both sides of your tympanic membrane or eardrum in order for you to hear properly. Now, an, uh, an obvious question is, well, why wouldn't the air pressure be the same? So when you take it on an airplane and the airplane takes off, the air pressure changes inside the cabin of that plane. So the air pressure now on the outside of your body is being now different than the air pressure in your middle ear. And most people will experience a popping sensation. Everybody know what I'm talking about? The plane takes off and you start to get this you know, kind of popping sensation and it's kind of bothersome. And so they'll tell you to chew gum, They'll tell you to uh, inflate your cheeks. Uh, another good thing is to pinch your nose and inflate your cheeks. To force air, to force air from your throat through the eustachian canals into the middle ear so that the air pressure will re -equal uh, e equilibrate, so it will re-equalize, so that the air pressure in your middle ear will return to being the same as on the outside of your body. The moment the air pressure in the middle ear becomes the same as on the outside of your body, that popping sensation will go away. Now, the, uh, uh, the eustachian canals have another important clinical role because if you had a sore throat, obviously this infection can spread up the eustachian canals into the middle ear. When that happens, that's called an earache. An earache is an infection in the middle ear. It's clinically called otitis media. Now, itis means an infection. Odo, anybody know what ot or odo means? Yeah. Ear. And media means middle. So putting it together, middle ear infection, or otitis media, or what we call an earache. So how you end up with an earache is because the infection travels from your throat up the auditory tubes or eustachian canals into the middle ear.
Now, the inner ear. I wrote that the stapes vibrates against this oval window, causing vibrating waves in the endolymph fluid of the cochlear canal. And we're all thinking, what? All right, so let's look at a, a picture here. Let's take a look at a page 81L. Do you think any of this is in the book or not? Nah, it's not that one. In fact, it is all in the book, and then so. And you can, and if you're thinking, you know, it'd be nice if you had color pictures. Guess what? There's color pictures in the book. All right. Anyhow, so here's uh, here it's showing uh, sound waves vibrating against the tympanic membrane. That causes these three bones to move. The malleus, incus, and stapes, right? Stirrup, it looks like a stirrup, all right? And so uh, these are vibrating. Incidentally, here's, this, this is the middle ear area. Here's that eustachian tube or canal that allows air to go from the nasopharynx uh, into the middle uh, ear. So the air pressure is the same here as it is out here. Now, this is that cochlea. Remember that thing that we said kind of looks like a snail? All right, so here it is. Now, this cochlea has a canal filled with fluid. This canal that's filled with fluid is called the cochlear canal. It's called the cochlear canal. It's filled with fluid. What do we call this fluid? It's called endolymph fluid. So it's filled with fluid called endolymph. <clears throat> now, there is a membrane, a membrane right here at the beginning of this cochlear canal or cochlear duct. This membrane is called the oval window. It's really just a membrane. All right, so there's a membrane. So you'll notice that the stirrup or stapes, right, when this thing is vibrating or moving, this stapes is vibrating right against this membrane or oval window, and that creates waves in that fluid. It creates waves. Now, you might say, I don't get that. How could that create waves? So uh, you'll see I've actually written this in the, uh, in the lecture outline. We'll show you in a moment. But just imagine if you had a glass aquarium tank. You know an aquarium tank where you put uh, tropical fish? And it's filled with water. If you start tapping the glass wall, isn't that going to cause that water to start sloshing? If you don't believe me, try it. Now, how the wave, the shape of the waves that you create is going to depend upon the frequency that you're tapping that wall, glass wall of the aquarium tank. If you tap it slower, you'll create a kind of longer wave. If you tap it with a higher frequency, it creates shorter waves. Does everybody follow that? So the different frequencies, high, medium, low, create different wave patterns in this fluid. All right, now let's look at the lower picture. In this lower picture, so here's the stapes or stirrup. It's vibrating against this membrane called the uh, oval window. And this is this cochlear canal or cochlear duct. What they did in this picture is they straightened it out. In reality, it's coiled, so it looks like a snail. But uh, they just straightened it out so it's easier to see. What it really looks like is this. It's all coiled, but they just kind of uncoiled it so it's straight. So uh, now, something else that's in the cochlea is a row of sensory neurons. These sensory neurons have little hairs. They have little hairs or cilia. And because they have little hairs, they're called hair cells. <clears throat> now. A high frequency sound, high, high frequency sound creates a short wave in this fluid. So a high pitch creates a short wave, and this wave causes a bending of the little hairs near the beginning of this cochlea. All right? So, uh, So this high-pitched sound is bending these hairs right here of these sensory neurons, and they're the ones sending a nerve impulse to your brain. 
When your brain receives signals from them, your brain interprets that as high, high pitch. Now, what, a, what about a medium pitch sound? Medium pitch is a slightly slow, slower frequency, and it creates a longer wave right here. And this longer wave in the fluid bends the hairs of these hair cells located here. And they send a signal to the brain. When they send a signal to your brain, your brain goes, oh, medium, medium pitch sound. And then, uh, what about a... Uh, A lower pitch sound creates a longer wave, right? And that bends these hairs or cilia of the hair cells way here at the end. And they send the signal to your brain. So depending upon which, isn't this amazing? Depending upon which sensory neuron sends signals to your brain, your brain perceives that. It creates a sensation in your mind of high, medium, or low. All right? So we wrote here, bending of the hairs, bending of these little hairs or cilia on these hair cells is what creates or generates an action potential. So that's how uh, your, your brain knows. Now, you might say, well, wait a second. All right, fine, a high, high pitch, medium, uh, low. Well, what if you had all three? Well, if you've got all three going on at once, you're creating waves in all three patterns. Orchestra. Yeah, an orchestra. So, uh, you know, I could have, uh, let's see, let's see. Can you hear both the high and the low? So you can hear all, all of it. And obviously, you can have a group of a, a choir, a, a choir, a group of people singing all kinds of different things. And of course, the rhythm that they are singing in, whether there's high pitch people singing benefit and low pitch singing. So that creates different patterns of the waves. And so you're just seeing these different hairs. You'd almost be watching these hairs move rhythmically with the different frequencies of sounds that are being created. Now, we've been saying that you've got this cochlear canal, or duct, filled with fluid. The, the hair cells are kind of right in here. And there's a whole other thing going on that I didn't even deal with. It's shown on the next page, 81M. Here on 81M, uh, these are what, uh, the hair cells, or cochlear receptors. Here's their axons, and they're sending action potentials to the brain. And uh, there's really not only this wave, but it actually causes, and I, I'm not asking you to know this, something called a tectorial membrane of the organ of corti to move. But let's see what, how I summarize this. Uh, back on page uh, 81G. So on 81G, inner ear, 81G, inner ear. So we wrote that the stapes vibrates against this membrane called the oval window, causing a vibrating waves in the endolymph fluid of the cochlear canal. I wrote, visualize, pounding your hand against the glass wall of an aquarium tank generates waves in the tank. <clears throat> now, so we've got it, part of the inner ear, the oval window. There's endolymph fluid in the cochlear canal, and there's the hair cells. Now, they're commonly called hair cells. The real technical name, the technical name is cochlear receptors or auditory receptors. After all, these are sensory neurons in the cochlea. Or they're called auditory receptors because these are the sensory neurons for hearing sound. Auditory, hearing. But they're, because they have little hairs, they're commonly for sure just called hair cells. So all three names mean the same thing. We wrote that as the fluid waves mechanically bend the hairs of these cochlear receptors, it activates action potentials which are then relayed towards the brain. The higher pitch sounds cause shorter fluid waves which mechanically bend the hairs of the hair cells near the beginning of the cochlear canal. On the next page, 81H, we wrote that lower pitch sounds cause longer fluid waves which mechanically bend the hairs of the hair cells towards the end of the cochlear canal. 
So depending upon which hair cells send the impulses to your brain, your brain interprets that as a high, medium, or low pitch sound. So now uh, let's uh, talk about where do these nerve, uh, where do these action potentials being sent by the, uh, these hair cells, these cochlear receptors, where are they going to in your brain? So let's talk about the neural pathway for hearing. Before I read you what's here, let's look at a picture. Uh, and again, let's look, uh, we'll make a note. The page we want to look at is 81M. So I'm just going to write C81M. C81M, and let's look on 81M. So on page 81M, I, I want to focus on the uh, lower picture. On 81M. So uh, what's it show? Obviously, this is the brain, and we're trying to show where these uh, 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 signals from the cochlea are going to in the brain. So here's the cochlea. That's that thing that... Uh, it kind of looks like a snail. Uh, inside is the cochlear canal filled with fluid that activates these hair cells inside. And uh, this is the vestibulocochlear nerve, cranial nerve number eight. And inside of it are millions of myelinated wires, myelinated nerve fibers that are sending action potentials. Action potentials to the brain. So uh, there's not just one of them, there are millions. And of course, they're not all activated necessarily at the same time. Uh, so let's see where they go. The first place they synapse is in the bottom part of your brain called the medulla oblongata. We know that's the low bottom of our brain. And they synapse in an area called the cochlear nucleus. And uh, that's not a bad name. Uh, uh, what does the word nucleus mean? Center, right? The area in the center of an atom is called the nucleus. And the organelle in the center of a cell is called the nucleus. And this is a brain center. And it's called the cochlear nucleus because this is where information from the cochlea first synapses. And then uh, it showed synapsing onto uh, a myelinated interneuron, which is doing what? It's decussating. It's crossing. Now, some nerve fibers, not all the nerve fibers, decussate. About 80% of the nerve fibers cross. 20% don't. We're focusing on those that do, because that's the majority. Everything in the body, as I've said over and over again, is always more complicated. But this is always, what I try to do is to at least give you a, a foundation. And as long as you appreciate that I'm just giving you an introduction to a subject, it always gets more complicated. So anyhow, most of the nerve fibers decussate, and they send signals where? To our old friend, the thalamus. We know that almost all sensory information eventually goes to the thalamus before it goes to higher brain areas. There it synapses in the thalamus onto myelinated nerve fibers that are sending the signal here to the sides of your brain. Now the sides, we know that when you learned anatomy, the bone on the side of your skull is called the temporal bone. And these lobes of your brain are called the temporal lobes here on the side. So this information is going to what's called the primary auditory area in the temporal lobe. So even though it's written here, it exists on both sides, both sides. Notice, because of the decussation, that the uh, hearing from the, let's say, left side of your left ear ends up going to the right side of your brain. And conversely, it doesn't show it, but the sounds from the right side would end up going here to the left side of your brain because of decussation, kind of a strange phenomenon. So this is the neural pathway. Let's summarize it. Uh, going back to the page where we were at, uh, 81H. So what did I say about this 80, uh, on 81H? So we wrote that... Uh, the nerve fibers uh, are in the vestibulocochlear nerve, cranial nerve number eight. 
Uh, they relay the information of the cochlear nucleus and the medulla oblongata. And then the nerve fibers decussate. I wrote that in. They decussate. And they relay the information to our old friend, the phallus. And then the nerve fibers relay the information to the primary auditory area located in the temporal lobe of the cerebral cortex. 